everybody. I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching Sit Down. Brand new book about the Trump administration. This is a good one. Michael Shear, Julie Hirschfeld Davis. Guys, how are you? Good. Good. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for having, having us. us. You got it. So I told you guys I'm about 100 pages in, and I, I can't stop reading this thing because, <laughs> as I was telling you, there's so much that has happened. There is so much happening every single day. So what was it like putting this whole thing together? Because you guys have infiltrated the Trump world and really exposed a lot of different things. So, Michael, let's start with you. You know, it... Um, one of the things that we said to each other when we started the book was, um, you know, we've been covering immigration policy for a long time in Washington. We want to write a book that has substance, that has meaning, that is about a policy, that uh, an issue that is sort of central to the American question, right? Of who are we as Americans? But we also wanted it to be broader than just that. We wanted it to be about the Trump presidency. And both of us had been at the time White House reporters. We, you know, there's an, it, there's an interest in helping people understand who this president is, how he makes decisions, um, the sort of chaotic shoot from the hip way that policy is made. And, and I think one of the things we're both proud of is that it, I think it accomplishes that, right? Through, through examining the, the first, essentially first two years plus of this presidency and how he dealt with this issue that is so central to his identity, I, th I, I think and I hope that people will come away with a better understanding of uh, the Trump presidency generally. And as reporters uh, sort of in the process of talking to sources and really fleshing out some of these moments that we had covered for the New York Times when they were happening, but getting to go back and talk to people, I think we both had a really fun experience of it was quite after every interview, we'd look at each other and be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. it was way more than even we understood at mm -hmm. the time. And it was just a really interesting, fascinating um, fun process of sort of digging and digging and trying to figure out what was actually happening way below the surface. We did a lot of the interviews over long dinners. Oh, okay. And, um, and inevitably, at the end of the dinners, we'd look at each other and <laughs> compare, you know, flip open our notebooks again and compare notes and think, wow, we had no idea. So how long were these dinners typically? They, they could be, they could go pretty <laughs> <Yeah>. late. <laughs> and a lot of times it wouldn't be till the next day when we'd sort of be going through our right. tape and, you know, writing up our notes that we would sort of look and say, oh my gosh, like, we, we gotta go back at that mm. because this was something that we didn't even know right. was happening. It was a whole nother thread, something else, you know, a whole uh, another set of people we have to go now talk to because, you know, all of a sudden we've gotten a nugget of information that we didn't have. So it could take a while. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So you guys both covered the Obama administration. When people look at the Trump administration, there are so many people that are sources that are talking and I find it interesting because they're willing to go into the whole thing. How does that compare to people that were in the Obama orbit? Well, I think, you know, the Obama administration, and I al also uh, covered a bit of the Bush administration before that, were typically much more disciplined. Like, you, it was really hard to get people, even in an off-the-record context, mm -hmm. really dishing on what was going on inside the agencies, inside the West Wing in particular, because people felt, first of all, a sense of real loyalty to to those presidents, a sense that the, sort of their agenda and their worldview was sort of tied up in the presidents, and they, you know, they sort of knew that if they undermined that in a way, um, that that would be counter to what they wanted, as well as counter to what you know, the, counter to the interest of the president. They would be embarrassing for the president, right. but also not great for them. In this White House, there are so many members of the administration, so many people inside the White House in that building who in various ways have felt either undercut or alarmed at what they see unfolding, that they're trying to kind of steer the ship in the right direction, but it keeps on going off course or the president keeps sort of undercutting them or his top aides do, that I think you just end up naturally having more people who are willing to kind of speak out of school about that. Right. So many people that have left the administration too, you know, it's like Tillerson and McMaster and Matt, there's so many names, you know, so it's like even having perspective from people who were in the room. You know, a lot of people want to talk about this stuff. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things that struck both Julie and I, and I think it's something that we didn't expect going in, is that uh, a, a lot of the frustration inside the administration didn't just come from so-called Obama holdovers or deep state people who <coughs> perhaps have a different uh, immigration agenda or a different idea of where the country should be going on this issue. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it came uh, oftentimes from people who the president had handpicked or his people had handpicked to run the relevant agencies, DHS, uh, the State Department people, um, but who came to really uh, reject and push back against some of the extreme things that the president wanted to do. I mean, it just, there were, there were so many people who uh, shared his overall view about wanting to limit immigration, both legal and illegal, but who 
you know, when, when pushed would say, Mr. President, that's illegal, mm -hmm. you can't do that, it's impractical, even if we wanted to do it, we couldn't do it. Um, and what you saw is that over time, those people were all pushed out. Um, you know, obviously the most, the most uh, dramatic was Kirsten Nielsen, who mm -hmm. had been the head of uh, Homeland Security, and ultimately she pushed back so much that it cost her her job. And for Nielsen, you guys tell the story, like she had that picture made up of what the wall would maybe look like, right? And President Trump didn't understand that that was just a mock-up. And he's like, can I tweet this? Can I put it out there? Like, that was just supposed to be like, oh, I want to save my ass, not like here's an actual picture. Like, that's a crazy story. Right, but I mean, that what that demonstrates is, you know, the degree to which so much of what his administration, the people in his administration were doing was about like appeasing mm -hmm. him and uh, talking him off of some of these ideas that they knew were never going to be able to be implemented. And even though he, you know, part of his uh, political appeal is that he was not a politician. He didn't, he hadn't been uh, running a big government bureaucracy before, so he didn't know how to do it, and that was like seen as a plus. Really, in the end, when you when you look at episodes like that, it, it, it undermines him. I mean, you know, she wasn't in the end working toward what he really wanted, which was this big, you know, spiky, electrified, hot, um, you know, potentially alligator enclosed barrier. She was basically spending her time figuring out ways to distract him when he got angry. Mm. Um, and she was doing it because she was trying to spend her time on the substantive policies that she thought could actually have an impact on the problem. And I think her assessment of that was probably right. But if you think about how sort of turned around that is, yeah. if you're the president, you know, that your staff is spending a substantial amount of their time just trying to distract you or divert you um, rather than actually talking to you about the ways that you can get what you want done and accomplished. One of the most fascinating quotes in there was from Steve Bannon who says that Trump is a bully and a coward. And he was one of the only guys that was really willing to go after President Trump. So when you think about him, what do you think his greatest effect was on Trump? Or wh how do you, you know, look at his role in the whole picture here? So I, th I think everything uh, about Bannon has to be filtered through the idea that they clearly had a falling out. Mm -hmm. He was pushed out of the administration relatively early, about halfway through that first year. Um, and, and also Bannon's history, right? Bannon is essentially a political anarchist. He's not somebody that um, ever uh, sort of supports the kind of traditional mainstream order of politics. And in fact, you know, part of what he and uh, Jeff Sessions, who later became Attorney General, and Steve Miller, who was obviously the president's top immigration aide, they all um, sort of plotted early on, long before Trump ever actually ran for president, uh, to try to blow up what they saw as this kind of um, you know, domination by both kind of Main Street Republicans and the Democratic Party. They wanted somebody that would uh, push back against that and put in place kind of policies that would never be kind of acceptable to the mainstream. And so part of the reason he's so willing to be outspoken is because now he's the bomb thrower again from the outside. He didn't succeed really on right. the inside. Uh, he, he kind of helped uh, push a bunch of uh, really aggressive policies, but in the end, he's not somebody that works inside the system, and so now that he's out, he's he's more willing to talk. The interesting thing about Bannon, too, is that he had these ideas about how you use immigration and demagogue immigration mm. to, to create a result in politics that predated Donald Trump, and he really saw uh, Donald Trump as sort of the vessel, we say in the book, of, of these ideas. He had been looking for a long time for sort of a populist figure who would, you know, take this immigration issue and take the issue of trade and really make it a central issue and appeal to a certain segment of voters that he believed were not being talked to by anyone in politics, the white working class, um, who President Trump sort of had a natural affinity for. And so he really sort of seized on Trump as he, as he was rising. And rather than pushing back, as we saw so many of the people in his administration do, Bannon was really in the business of feeding Trump's impulses on this issue. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, kind of sent him in some of these directions that ended up uh, derailing early on in the administration. I think feeding of impulses is a really good way to put it because whether you think about the wall, the travel ban, separation of families, there's a lot of chatter from a lot of different people on these topics. So when it comes to Trump's immigration policy in general, what do you guys see as the biggest misstep? Where did the biggest failure happen and why do you think it happened too? So I think probably the biggest um, public failure was the, f the was the family separation policy, which you know was in place only formally for several weeks, and then they abandoned it un under intense public pressure. Um, 
we sat down with Stephen Miller just a week or so before they they abandoned the policy mm -hmm. that summer, and uh, he was de utterly defiant, uh, insisting that they wouldn't back down, insisting that it was the right policy to deter uh, migrants from coming into the United States, that, that it essentially had to be uh, so such a horrible process, that they had to face such horrible prospects coming to the United States that they wouldn't even bother to try. And I think when that finally went awry and they had to back down, uh, that was probably their biggest failure. I think part of what we argue in the book is that those earlier, that, that, that it took them a long time, took Miller, took the president, took the people in the administration a long time to figure out how the levers of power really work. Mm. Um, and the travel ban is an example of an early thing they did that first week in office that went off the rails almost <laughs> immediately <laughs> and they couldn't kind of get back and for, for almost a whole year. Um, and, th and, and, but they got better. Mm -hmm. And by the, t by the time you sort of see the, kind of by the time they push out, Miller finally succeeds in pushing out Kirsten Nielsen earlier this year and pushing out a bunch of other folks that are, whose names are less well known but who were very important in leadership positions, I think what you've seen since then is a real acceleration of some of these policies that were on the whiteboard that Steve Bannon and Steve Miller had in those early days of the administration where they listed all the things they want to do, all of the restrictionist policies they wanted to put in place, and they're finally getting, getting through now. And it seems like Miller's the guy who's just going to be there as the ship's going down. It doesn't matter what's going to happen. So you guys spent time with him. What interests you the most about that whole story? Because here's a guy who's working for Jeff Sessions. He's not really well known in Washington, and now he is making policy for immigration. So what surprised you the most about that conversation? Well, I mean, I worked with Stephen Miller when I was covering Capitol Hill mm. years ago, and he was working for uh, Jeff Sessions right. when he was a senator. Um, and his sort of uh, stance at the time was he was the staffer who knew a lot about immigration, but was you know very much on the fringes of the debate and trying to derail all the compromises that were sort of in the works among Democrats and Republicans, trying to figure out some sort of bipartisan consensus, whether that be to legalize the Dreamers mm -hmm. or to have a you know a, a pathway to citizenship for the undocumented, all of the undocumented population that's already in the country. Uh, he always saw it as his role to sort of you know take the air out, of, put punch holes in that balloon. Um, and he was pretty successful at it. And he had this way about him then that I think has really dovetailed nicely with President Trump's sort of approach to politics, which is all about sort of trolling progressives. That he, the more uh, sort of provocative he could be, the more extreme his uh, speeches could be, the, you know, he would send around these talking points with all of these sort of negative things about immigrants in them and how they hurt Americans and hurt American jobs that no other, uh, congressional aide that I ever dealt with would have been willing to put in an email and he would just sort of daily sort of send these things around. He was willing to say and do things to get a rise out of his political opponents that other people weren't and that I think is what drew him to Trump and what, and what attracted, uh, appealed to mm. Trump about him and so he really sort of became untouchable in Trump's orbit and as you see Trump sort of lash out at various figures in and around this issue, Miller manages to never be one of them. But, mm. but the other thing about Miller that's interesting is, as Julie described his background, he's not a lawyer, right? right. He's not really a policy guy. He's a communications guy. And, and so part of the problem that the Trump administration and Miller had that they couldn't quite figure out in the beginning was, how do you actually make this work? Mm. And um, he would, he would, they initially recruited a whole cadre of people who had been on the Hill with Miller in various positions who are all on the fringe, like like Julie described, all on the fringe of kind of immigration policy, never really accepted. And he thought, I think, that they would help him kind of finally put push through all of these ideas that he had constantly been sending emails to people like Julie. <laughs> right, I was gonna <laughs> say you're on the receiving end of those crazy emails. Crazy yeah. emails, like we both were. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and, and what, he, what he realized is that eventually, a lot of those people, even though they shared his ideas, they also, many of them were lawyers, and many of them understood that there were limits, that there, you know, that, that if you wanted to do something, you still had to jump through the proper hoops, you still had to do the, the, the work, the legal work, to, to actually put it into effect, and that frustrated Miller. He became very angry, and sort of hmm. the president did too. Yeah, no question. So you can make the argument that President Trump is pretty delusional about a lot of different things. The wall seems to be something that he doesn't have a great sense of reality about. 
why is there such a fascination with the wall and why has this gone on for so many years? Well, it's interesting. I mean, we talk in the book about how the wall was never supposed to be, he, it, wasn't, it wasn't Trump who said, oh, I'm going to run right. and the wall is going to be my thing. He, he always talked about illegal immigration and, and his advisors early on knew that, you know, that was getting a big reaction from crowds. And there were people like Steve Bannon who were sort of on the outside at that point who understood that this could be really powerful as a political theme for him. And they essentially made the case that he needed to talk about the wall because they knew that he's a real estate guy, he's a builder. Mm -hmm. This was sort of a mnemonic device for him to remember, remember to talk about Right, because he could never remember the speeches. Because um, right. yeah. he loves to talk about being, you know, Donald Trump and I'm the best at this and I'm a builder. And so they knew that once he got on that tangent, it was going to take off. But unless he had that in his head, it was unlikely to sort of occur to him to start talking about the wall, uh, or about uh, immigration. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, the other thing that is that is in, in essential to understand about uh, Trump is that he is a performer, and he's such mm -hmm. a, a political animal in that way. He sort of thrives on that feedback loop of response from the crowd, and I think he it became almost Pavlovian, yeah. where he would talk about the wall at rallies, and people would just scream, and they would be so uh, riled up about it. He loved that, and so he, you know, barring anything else, no matter where he was or what else he was doing, he would always come back to that because he loved the rise that got out of his crowds and they loved hearing him talk about it and I think it just beca it became really a symbol of the whole approach that he had on immigration that it was about keeping people out protecting ourselves and you know being tough and being sort of willing to talk about how tough he was going to be yeah and it really doesn't get at the heart of what he actually needs to change in terms of the immigration debate you know like no I mean it look th there there are uh, there are people who uh, are experts about the border who will say that there are some barriers that can be helpful in certain places. There's almost nobody that we talk to uh, who argues that a massive wall across every part of the border, it makes any sort of sense, right. either economically or, or actually in solving the problem. And yet he was never willing to give it up. And you, you saw, you know, towards the end uh, of our book, we describe a scene in which Jared Kushner, his, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. his son-in-law, uh, finally in a kind of immigration 101 session with a bunch of, of immigration experts is told that if, uh, that if the wall were constructed the way President Trump wanted, that it would solve maybe 20% of the problem. Mm -hmm. And he sort of is stunned and taken aback and says, well, then we've wasted the last two years. Why, you know, and this is in the midst of a big shutdown fight over, uh, over, uh, over wall funding. And uh, you know, that said, there is no indication, I think, that Julie and I ever found that even once they sort of confronted with that reality that the president is going give, to give up on it or mm. back down from it because it is, as Julie said, the totem of his, it, it is the symbol. It is the symbol of all of this stuff. Um, and I think uh, ultimately it's, 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 it's why we focus on it a lot in the book. Yeah, definitely. I think it's hard to tell what will happen with this administration, you know, just given what's going on with the impeach impeachment hearings right now. But when you guys think about your book, what surprised you the most in this whole immigration story? Well, I, th I think I was actually pretty surprised that in the end, I mean, we knew, I think, going in that the wall uh, as a sort of a, a countermeasure is, was not likely to make a big dent in the immigration problem. I think what we didn't realize going in is the degree to which the wall had actually worked at cross purposes with the rest of what President Trump wanted to do mm. on immigration. How it not only did it not fix the problem, but in some ways his fixation with it made the whole problem worse because it sapped... Uh, the ability for him to work with Democrats in Congress. It basically made it so that he, you know, didn't feel like he could ever compromise because uh, people on, on the other side of the issue were just so offended and alienated by this idea of a wall that they felt like they could never sit down and cut a deal with him. And, and early on during his campaign, he is told by a group of, uh, you know, hardliners yeah. who have long wanted to not only cut down on illegal immigration, but also reduce legal immigration that, like, the wall is really not a thing for us. Like mm. we don't really care about right. that. There's all these other policy <laughs> things we've been trying to get done for a really long time that, you know, are much more important. And, you know, I think a lot of them come away pretty disappointed with the results and a lot of it is because of his fixation with this with the with the wall which has become such a part of his brand that he can't let go of it. You guys also have the story early on in the book about the dreamers and that's something that's come back into the news and it seemed as though there were a certain group of people that thought, like, he fi Trump finally understood what was happening with these people. And then he obviously goes a much different direction. So what was it like unpacking that story? Why don't you explain that for everybody? Sure. That, I mean, and it is coming back because he ultimately ordered the program that protects dreamers shut down, and that's going to come back to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. uh, 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 in, in a, few, a matter of a few weeks, yeah. and that'll be argued again. Um, 
You know, it's the one area, I think, there's not a lot of areas in immigration where Trump seems to have a soft spot. Um, that was the one area where he had met with Dreamers, a, a meeting that we document in the book, he had met with Dreamers years before he ran for president, he, so he had a sort of a sense, an idea of who they were, and he, uh, his, his hardcore advisors, Bannon, Miller, others around him, really worried that this was his soft spot, that he was going to uh, make a deal, cut a deal for the Dreamers, which would send exactly the wrong message from Miller's perspective and from Bannon's perspective to the to the base. You know that that somehow Trump was soft on immigration. Uh, Bannon really did orchestrate the kind of legal maneuvering that kind of boxed Trump in, where Trump ultimately had to uh, uh, sort of felt like he had no choice but to end the program. And then I think to Julie's point. Trump thought, well, I'm going to end the program, but I'm going to then cut a deal with Congress so that I can sort of have it both ways. I will be have, have been seen ending the program, but then I'll be the savior that will ultimately save the, mm -hmm. the program, and I'll get a lot of stuff. And he never could, because they could never compromise. They could mm -hmm. never um, you know, figure a way to kind of get to that sort of common sense approach. And, and, and he, he's essentially the one, he and Miller and the people around him were the one that blew that up. Mm -hmm. One of the really ironic parts is that the Republican Party, after Romney, really wanted to walk it back and be more friendly to the Hispanic culture. I mean, this is Romney who had said, people are going to self-deport. It's going to be that <laughs> difficult, which you guys throw in the book. And again, it was somebody that was rich and had that look, and Trump certainly had that look, but the way that Trump resonated with Middle America and the way that these immigration policies resonated with that base is not that far off from what Romney wanted to do, and yet he was able to cut through. So I'm sure that's pretty fascinating for you guys to unpeel as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating the degree to which uh, the whole Trump effect, and certainly this issue was really a, a reaction mm -hmm. against that kind of approach from Romney, because at this dinner party that we talk about in the book, which is at Steve Bannon's uh, house on Capitol Hill, where he has Steve Miller and Jeff Sessions, and they're having dinner. This is before uh, Trump is really a factor in the race at all. Um, you know, they're t basically talking about this article that's been written by a conservative that essentially argues that the reason that Mitt Romney lost was not because of all of the, the sort of Republican consensus, which was that they had alienated Hispanics, that they had, you know, not had a, a broad enough appeal or a big enough tent, but instead that Mitt Romney had been unable to appeal to the white working class voters, mm. uh, these people who felt alienated and displaced and both economically and culturally sort of pushed to the side. And so, you know, in a way, the fact that the whole Republican Party had reached this consensus, well, we're the smart people in the room, we know what went wrong, you know, it was this. Um, there was this whole other faction in the Republican Party that did not believe that at all, and they are the faction that ultimately Trump takes hold of and pulls the entire party over to where he is on this and has been very successful in completely changing the consensus. Yeah. So that now if you ask a Republican, you know, what is the, you know, uh, the safe place for you to be on immigration, it is not sort of in the middle where, right. you know, I think we need to secure the border, but I also think we need to uh, normalize the status of people. It's, you know, we need to deport more people, we need to secure the border, mm. we need to, need to be as tough as we can possibly be. And I think that's one of the lasting implications, and I think one of the things that we argue in the book is that policies here or there might be rolled back, another president's going to come in office at some point and, 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 and things w you know, can sort of change back and forth from a policy perspective, but, but he has really changed the consensus. What used to be a sort of a consensus uh, between Democrats and Republicans, obviously a still a you know, fierce fight over the years, but a, a sort of general consensus that immigration is good and then we got to figure out how to, how to solve the problems that, that come, with, come with along with that. Um, he's really changed the consensus and really changed uh, certainly the Republican Party, but I think also more broadly the kind of way America uh, is grappling with this issue. It's much more polarized. It's much more, um, you know, uh, un unforgiving of uh, immigrants and immigration. And uh, I think it's unclear, uh, uh, it's hard to make predictions, but it's unclear how, how quickly that changes mm -hmm. even when he's not there. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Do you think people in the Trump White House will read your book? We, s we certainly hope so. Yeah. S somebody must be, because he seems to know about it. So. Yeah, there's, got, there's <laughs> got to be somebody responsible for all these books that come out, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and we, we interviewed the president at the end of the uh, process. Uh, we, we, we got 35 minutes with him in the Oval Office. Um, and, uh, and at the end, he, 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 as we were walking out, he said, well, if I like the book, I'll tweet about it. Um, <laughs> and uh, he has tweeted already. He has, he, yes. So, so, How know. tough was it to get those 35 minutes? It was it was pretty tough. I think we both thought that we probably wouldn't wouldn't mm -hmm. get them, particularly after we had gone about the process, which we 
um, sort of were doing very diligently at the end of our reporting where we were going back to people in the West Wing and saying, okay, here are the things that we have that we, we will need you to respond right. to. So it was some pretty tough stuff and some pretty sensitive, you know, meetings that we had gotten to the bottom of. And we thought, you know, once they know that we know all of this, who knows whether they're going to want to let us anywhere near mm. uh, President Trump. But in the end, uh, he was doing a bunch of interviews at the time. He was, it was just after he had sort of officially announced his re-election run, even mm. though he's been running for re-election <laughs> right. since yeah. the day he yeah. won election. Um, but... But yeah, so we, we were, uh, I think we had gotten to the point where we thought we might not get time with him, but it, but he did, he did you know, provide and the time and, and was willing to talk about it. And I think in part because, and he sort of said this during the interview, um, he, this, this issue matters to him. Mm. You know, he wants people to understand where he's coming from on this, even, even if his version of that is very different from what you come away with from hearing right. what actually went on. And I think it was really interesting, the main, the main takeaway, I mean, there's a lot in there, and we, right. and we talk about the interview. Could have written a book on the 35 right. minutes, right? But, but, but the, we, we, wanted, we wanted to make sure we pressed him on this one point, and so we asked him, do you think you will be remembered as a xenophobic president, mm. as a person who, who doesn't like immigrants? And it, it was really, his in answer was really interesting. He sort of initially said, no, no, no. And then said, well, I think you may be right. I think that may be how I'll be remembered, wow. but I hope not. I hope not. And then he sort of went on and continued to sort of defend his policies and why they weren't racist, et cetera. Um, but I thought that the, the uh, really we tough. both thought yeah. that the response that at some level he understands that the stuff that we document in the book um, is, is going to be part of his legacy and part of his lasting, uh, what people remember about him. And, uh, uh, you know, there is a there is a part of him, despite all the bluster, that kind of gets that. Mm. That's really fascinating, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an absolute thank pleasure. Thank you so much. Definitely pick up this book. Check it out right now. It's out wherever you get books. For Michael and Julie, I'm DJ. See you next time here on the Sit Down.